Hello, everybody. I'm Dan Jurgen, Vice Chairman of IHS Market, and I want to welcome you to Sear Week Conversations presented by IHS Market. We're very pleased today to be talking with Mike Worth, who's the Chairman and CEO of Chevron. And Mike, welcome to Sear Week Conversations. Thank you, Dan. It's, it's a pleasure to join you uh, virtually from my uh, desk at home. Right. It's all of our home studios. Mike, I thought we might start uh, when we were talking before. You mentioned you were in Singapore when the SARS outbreak uh, occurred mm -hmm. and wanted to ask you just what you learned from that and took away from that. Yeah, so I did. I lived in, in Singapore uh, in, my gosh, it's almost 20 years ago now when SARS broke out. And Singapore, Hong Kong, and China were, uh, you know, most heavily impacted by that. And, uh, you know, relatively small scale in the scheme of what we're experiencing now with COVID-19. Uh, but at the time, really impactful, particularly in those communities. I recall how quickly people modified their behavior. And uh, the fear of the unknown uh, was uh, palpable. And people didn't know uh, how it was being passed within the community, didn't know who they could trust. And there was a period of time there where uh, the uncertainty was, was very high. And of course, uh, SARS had a high fatality rate. And so uh, anybody who caught SARS, uh, you know, there was a real concern about whether they would survive. Singapore, very advanced country, managed to get their arms around it pretty quickly uh, with uh, both medical technology, contact tracing, and, and technology enabled tracing but the the kind of the emotional residue was with us for quite a long time and even even after the health uh, scare had been uh, kind of brought under control people didn't forget it easily and I don't think uh, they, they, you know, they, they, they did make changes in some of their behavior and it was only a very gradual process where we saw people come back and these were you know whether it was employees of our company or um, uh, friends and family. We had small children in school at the time. Uh, it was on everybody's mind for, for much longer than the actual, uh, you know, in hindsight, the actual health risk was high. And uh, we certainly as a company uh, used that experience to begin our pandemic response plan. You may be the only company I know of, at least that I know of, that actually had a pandemic response plan. Can you just say a little bit about that and, and how you developed it? Yeah, well, so, you know, many, many companies have uh, business continuity plans and, um, and emergency response plans for unforeseen uh, developments that could impact their business. We have a, a very specifically uh, drawn pandemic response plan that, that was created in the aftermath of SARS. And then we had various avian and swine flu cases, MERS, Ebola, Zika. Uh, we've continually refreshed it as uh, as we face these threats. And of course, uh, you know, we operate around the world like so many companies in our industry do that uh, something like Zika or, or MERS or Ebola could feel far away to people in the United States, uh, but it's very present for a company that operates in the regions of the world where these viruses have uh, have broken out and have created uh, real concerns. So we have a very structured uh, pandemic response plan that has been continually upgraded. We activated it in January. So this is before it was much of a concern even in Europe and certainly not in North America, but you know we're in China and we're watching the data carefully and stood up our corporate pandemic response team. And very quickly we had 50 some odd uh, regional and local pandemic response teams set up around the world, uh, reflecting our operating footprint to try to get ahead of this, to begin to stand up some of the uh, preventive measures and safeguards, uh, start to think about uh, hygiene, distancing, cleaning, uh, prepare for alternate shift schedules, different types of work uh, modes. And so we, we've been, um, I think well prepared for this. Obviously, you continue to adjust to new information as it emerges and as we learn more. Uh, but we did have a we did have a plan, and I think there's there's value in having a plan and a place to start. And how how is it affecting your operations now? The the virus in terms of what has gone smoothly? What have been the challenges? Yeah, so I'll start with our operations, uh, where the real heroes are the people that show up every day to keep energy flowing into the economy. 
which supports the goods and services that we all rely on and certainly supports the, uh, the pandemic response effort. It's hard because uh, we have to really be conscious of uh, the risks in, in a work environment. Uh, so everything from shift scheduling to um, you know hygiene and, and distancing standards exist throughout our operations. Uh, we've been largely unaffected in terms of uh, direct impact from the, the health crisis. We've got uh, uh, 150 cases now in our employees and contractor workforce, more so contractors than employees, um, and concentrated in a few areas, with Kazakhstan being the one that's had the, the most significant numbers, uh, although mostly asymptomatic or very mildly mm -hmm. symptomatic cases. I think the biggest challenge, Dan, for us, and I think this is true for others in our industry that have workforces that rotate to locations in, in, in remote and distant uh, uh, geographies, uh, the travel restrictions that governments have imposed make it very difficult to bring people to work or away from work. And so we're working very carefully to try to be sure that uh, we're doing all we can uh, to enable that so people get the rest that they need and get away from work. But that's, that's probably the biggest single challenge is moving people around the world uh, into right. some of the locations where that's our mode of operation. I guess the Tengiz right now, I suppose, is your biggest capital project and yes. where you have the most people on site. And I think you've talked about how you've had to change the schedules. Yeah, we've had, uh, you know, north of 25,000 people on site there uh, when this began, we're progressing a large project to expand uh, the production capacity at Tengiz to about a million barrels a day. Uh, project slated to come on 24 months from now. And uh, we're bringing modules in from Korea. Uh, and uh, certainly South Korea saw this early on and uh, has managed it quite well. Uh, we're down to the last half dozen or so modules that will ship out this quarter. But on site, uh, we have people that live in about 100 different camps and different trades and crafts that are required for uh, construction uh, on site and different nationalities. They come from many different countries. Uh, we've had um, out, an outbreak within some of the camps, the contractor camps, and, uh, and have isolated uh, workers and have begun to actually demobilize non-critical path activity. So uh, we're, we're able to maintain work on the core critical path uh, construction and that will require several thousand workers, but there are on the order of 15,000, 15 to 20,000 workers that uh, we will demobilize, and we're in the process, we've largely accomplished that now, and then bring them back here uh, a few months into the future as we feel like we understand the, uh, the health risks better, and as that work begins to come back onto the critical path, the, the plan would be to remobilize uh, with even stronger and more robust protections in place uh, testing is getting better all the time now, the access to testing uh, technology and capability. And so a uh, very thoughtful uh, effort to demobilize uh, and working closely with the, with the authorities there uh, to do it in a way that is, that is safe. Right. So overall around the world, obviously people need to go in and work refineries. They need to be on platforms. But a lot of your people now are working remotely. And how's the communication been? Yeah, so, so about a quarter of our workforce are out on uh, operating facilities, ships, rigs, refineries, plants, and about three quarters uh, work in some sort of an office environment from small ones to, to, to large ones. Um, by and large, we've transitioned to working from home or from alternate locations for, for almost all of that workforce. And it has been, I think, smoother than most people would have guessed if you would have said, we're going to do this and we do it in a very short time period. Uh, we closed the books on a quarter uh, for the first time ever with everybody working remotely uh, around the world. We have uh, managed to continue uh, you know, the uh, core uh, functions of, of the business with a workforce that's working remotely. You know, a lot of our people are set up to travel, to work from home, and so uh, they have the basic technology, and we've been investing in the infrastructure to enable uh, remote work uh, for years. Uh, we're really, I think... Uh, climbing the capability curve more rapidly than uh, we would have in normal times. Well, one thing with, of course, uh, the oil industry, the global oil and gas industry has continued to deliver and has shown, I think, resilience that, uh, you know, some people might have doubted beforehand. Everybody has 
uh, a different definition of what's essential. And I actually worked, I chaired a business roundtable uh, task force to try to get the states in the U.S. to agree on a common set of definitions because I learned from, you know, my counterparts at companies like 3M and Johnson & Johnson uh, and Procter & Gamble that their supply chains uh, for everything from hand sanitizer to PPE rely on small and mid-sized suppliers who are being shut down by well-intentioned local officials. Um, energy has been pretty uh, clearly deemed essential because the supply chains that uh, support everyday life and especially support the, uh, the health of medical industry require energy to, to function. So our workers have been deemed essential by governments around the world, uh, but they still work under these very uh, demanding circumstances with a lot of uncertainty. And I think the industry uh, has a lot to be very proud of that uh, we've been able to continue to meet those needs uh, even as demand has come off and, uh, and markets now uh, are, are pretty well supplied. But if you didn't have the essential uh, products and services that enable the response, uh, the situation would be even worse. And so I think our industry, as it always does during times of crisis, be they natural disasters, conflicts, uh, different uh, uh, you know, unforeseen events, uh, the men and women of our industry step up and uh, and perform in a way that, that should make everything well, work. One thing that people hadn't thought about, you know, not so long ago, people were criticizing plastics and uh, everything like mm -hmm. that. And, and now, I mean, what what is PPE? It's mostly plastics. It wouldn't exist without the petrochemical industry. Uh, Gloves, gowns, masks, face shields. And if you go into an emergency room, an intensive care unit or a hospital, uh, the medical supplies and medical equipment are manufactured from, uh, from, from materials derived from petrochemical products. They're packaged and then they're kept sanitary and, and sterile uh, by, by these products. And so, uh, yeah, our, our industry is, is ubiquitous and essential uh, in particularly in, uh, in terms of the, the things that are absolutely necessary for health professionals to respond to this. Yeah. For whether it's either, as you say, an emergency room or even, you know, people are discovering there is an advantage of plastic bags over reused cloth bags in terms of, of safety and health. But I think it's, it's yeah. not a message that's well recognized, I think. Uh, you know, people, I don't, do you feel people make the connection? Between what you no, do. you know, right now people are, are um, I think, focused on the first order issues that they're facing. Right? Are they safe? Is their family safe? Um, how do they change their behavior to try to um, to try to ensure people stay safe? And then the next order, which is, do I have a job? Uh, how are my finances? And so I think these other issues, uh, as a matter of kind of uh, interest or policy, are are lower down the list for the average person. People that are close to the industries are aware of them, but I think the average person is, is not. Uh, you did say that, uh, obviously, as you noted, we're in an area in which demand has collapsed in a way that probably had never been anticipated. Uh, the severity of the downturn, uh, how has it affected you all? How are, how are you adjusting? Well, I think like everybody, we've seen demand for finished products uh, collapse with the, uh, the policies to, to restrict uh, economic activity around the world. Certainly, uh, jet fuel has been the most heavily impacted and, and you've seen that you know, the aviation industry is under extreme uh, uh, pressure right now. Uh, gasoline, uh, probably next in, in terms of impact, um, kind of plus or minus 50%, sometimes more than that, uh, as these lockdowns uh, have, have gone into place. A diesel fuel a little bit less because it's you know, agriculture and, and transport of goods and services are still required. Um, and, uh, and so you know, we were already in a market that was pretty well supplied and uh, we had you know, OPEC with uh, you know, production cuts in place uh, you know, through you know, the last few years for the most part. And, um, and I think the margin and price environment has reflected a pretty well supplied market. As the demand dropped off dramatically, and then of course we had the uh, the breakdown in the relationship between Saudi Arabia and Russia at the OPEC meeting, um, yeah, it's uh, it's created a, a market that's tremendously oversupplied, uh, and demand is uh, has dropped at a rate and uh, in a magnitude we've never really seen in, in modern yeah, times. I, I think, so, you know, things, I, was th I was thinking that uh, it used to be that thirty dollars a barrel would be the worst case scenario. 
Now $30 a barrel is in a sense a, almost a welcome scenario given where, where the market has been. Amazing how quickly we normalize uh, our expectations. Uh, yeah. yeah, when we've been down in single digits and in the teens, $30 seems like at least a waypoint uh, on the journey back to what you would consider to be a more normal balance in the market and, and prices that uh, incent the right kinds of investments and yeah. development. Uh, the other day in your earnings call, you you said that kind of everybody more or less everybody knows what the playbook it is, but the question is execution of the playbook. And I thought maybe you could elaborate on that. Sure. Yeah, we're we're a commodity business, and as you've chronicled, uh, you know, in your your writings over the years, uh, the cycles of the industry are are well known, and um, you know the the market is never truly in balance. It's always in transition from length. To, to shortage and uh, and demand and supply are constantly moving. You've got um, storage and inventory that, uh, that that help work through the uh, imbalances as they occur. And then the market signals uh, tend to incent consumption or conservation, investment or or slowing down of investment. But uh, but there are cycles. It's a commodity business and it's prone to cycles. Um, and it's a capital intensive business, which means. Uh, you know, your, your balance sheet really matters. And so certainly, you know, having grown up in the downstream side of the business where margins are uh, tough and generally, you know, you, you prepare for them to be tougher next year than they are this year. Um, I've tried to, uh, to position our company to uh, compete and be successful no matter what the environment. And then we have to be prepared for a downturn. We'd been in a long economic expansion. And, and I think most people expected some sort of a, a recession here in the upcoming uh, period of time, nobody expected it to be as deep or as dramatic as what we're experiencing now. We had the company prepared with a, with a strong balance sheet, low levels of debt, uh, a flexible capital budget, which we've intentionally reshaped from one that a decade ago was heavily dependent on long cycle, uh, very expensive projects where you have little flexibility once you've, you know, once you've sanctioned the project to one now that is dominated by shorter cycle projects where we do have flexibility, and then a low break-even price. And so we've been trying to take our cost structure down, invest in assets that have a lower cost of supply so that we could be prepared uh, for a down cycle and to, uh, and to be strong enough to withstand even a prolonged uh, period of time of tough market conditions. And uh, I just, you know, I have a fundamental uh, kind of a belief that I've grown up with that that's the prudent way to run a, a commodity uh, company in markets that are uncertain and, and prone to cycles. And so, um, look, everybody's feeling pain right now, uh, and, and we're certainly in that category. Uh, I feel like we had positioned ourselves uh, to be ready for this and, um, and, and to ride through this, uh, but it'll be tough. Everybody's going to have to make adjustments. We have others. Others are doing yeah. the same thing. You, um, I mean, I think you always had a large acreage position in the Permian, but was the focus of turning to the Permian a deliberate effort to build flexibility and short cycle into the business? Well, it, it was because the Permian is highly economic and uh, economic even at, at lower prices. And we do have uh, a substantial acreage position there, mostly uh, fee acreage. So we don't have uh, drilling obligations. We don't have royalty obligations on it. And so the, uh, the manner in which we hold the land makes it even, even more attractive. But on the kind of first order economics, it's an attractive investment. And then the, uh, the flexibility of it is something that we've absolutely uh, you know, been conscious in building that into our, uh, our capital plans. And so it, it, works at, it works at multiple levels. Uh, we, we didn't intend to, you know, we'd like to run it ratably. You can really improve execution uh, when you have this factory kind of operation and you keep repeating and improving and pushing to uh, use technology and techniques and learnings to get even better. And we're certainly on that path. So the intent wasn't to bring levels down uh, unless we had to, but we wanted to have the ability to do that uh, in the event we needed to. And it's, uh, you know, I think it served us well uh, as we've gone into this period. Well, of time. that's right. So as you've cut back now, um, first, I think you make a distinction between curtailments and shut-ins, right? Because we, we have, in a new paper we've done, about 17 million barrels a day of shut-in from OPEC, non-OPEC, pl 
plus what companies are doing. In your mind, what's how do you, what's the distinction between curtailments and shutting in? Yeah, so um, you know, right now we're shutting in in some of the OPEC or OPEC plus countries uh, as a result of government uh, uh, actions, and then in primarily North America uh, due to economics and logistics. Uh, broadly speaking, I would say more of what we're doing is curtailing than actually shutting in, and um, and you can, you know restrict flow uh, from your wells without actually shutting them down completely. And of course, each, each reservoir is different, uh, wells are different, uh, the, the, the technical issues, the logistics and financial issues, uh, economic issues can, can vary. Uh, but, but broadly speaking, we, we've taken some complete shutdowns. Uh, but in general, if you can keep production flowing, uh, the, uh, you, you can mitigate uh, some of the risks of, uh, of a hard shutdown and a restart, uh, which um, can you know, be solved with people and money and, uh, and, and you know, technology usually. So, but, so uh, even, with the, even with the Permian, you're able to curtail rather than shutting in the wells altogether? Yeah, well, yeah and it varies. There, there are some areas where we may do uh, a shut-in uh, of an area completely, uh, which allows us to take some cost, which in the short term might be variable, but in the medium term, uh, or in the short term may feel like it's fixed, but in the medium term it can be variable to the extent you can shut down an area of operations, the infrastructure that, that goes along with that. Um, and so there, there will be some areas where we, we may take in full shutdowns, but more of that would be curtailing production to uh, uh, limit some of the economic uh, impacts of these things, but also reduce the risk of damage to reservoir or well. Right. Uh, listening to you and again, what you were talking about a week or two ago on your earnings call, I have the sense that resources are an asset, um, uh, technology is an asset, but that you see the balance sheet as an asset too. And I thought maybe ask you to just elaborate on that idea. Yeah, you know, I, I really uh, learned this from our uh, now retired chief financial officer, Pat Yarrington, who uh, emphasized to me throughout my career that the balance sheet is one of the most important assets the company has. As an engineer, I tend to think of refineries and platforms and, and oil fields. Valve. Valve. Yeah, as our assets. And, um, and the message that Pat was making is that the balance sheet is an asset that you will have to rely on at some point. And if your balance sheet has been weakened, like any other asset, if it hasn't been uh, maintained and uh, taken care of, invested in, um, it, it can't perform the way you may need it to perform. And on the other hand, if you tend to your balance sheet the way you should tend to every other asset in your portfolio, when the day comes that you really need to lean on it, your balance sheet will be strong, it will be healthy, and you'll have the ability to get performance out of that asset when some of your other assets are under stress because they can't perform, largely because of things outside of our control. And so um, I think it has led us to have a kind of a conservative view on uh, uh, financial matters, but certainly one that, again, to my earlier comments on commodity business, uh, you do need to be prepared for these cycles. Right. Well, where we are in the cycle now, uh, does it look to you that we're storage is pretty full or very full? I, I would say it's, uh, it's fully spoken for, if not fully utilized. Uh, it's pretty, pretty hard to get your hands on storage right now, be it onshore or floating. Um, it's, it's pretty well committed. And uh, of course, those who hold the storage, uh, they've got some options. They can use it, they can uh, make it available to others, uh, they can hold it for the future, depending upon their view of the market, but access to storage is pretty pretty tough right now. If we look to another part of your business, uh, which is LNG, how, do you, how, how, do, how does that look now? Yeah, so LNG um, markets had already been really characterized by uh, a surge of supply that we've seen uh, over recent years and steady demand growth. Certainly a couple of years ago, China uh, showed some real strong demand growth, uh, which has, has flattened out a little bit now. But LNG markets had been um, cyclically uh, a little low on supply and demand you know, kind of grows steadily where supply comes in these big tranches. 
And so we'd already seen LNG prices, uh, you know, reflecting that uh, this current circumstance doesn't uh, doesn't help as economies have slowed down and demand for LNG uh, reflects that as well. And so you're seeing cargoes out of the U.S. that are not flowing that people expected to flow. Uh, prices uh, are are reflecting spot prices. Um, our company sells most of our LNG on long-term contracts that are tied to oil uh, pricing. And so to this point, and these contracts tend to be lagged, you know, 60, 90 days, sometimes a little bit more than that even. And so our LNG sales have actually reflected oil prices uh, back uh, when they were at higher levels than they are. Now we're beginning to see these lower oil prices will roll into our contract pricing, which will bring uh, oil link prices down closer to where LNG spot prices have been here over these next uh, yeah. period of time. And it clearly a lot depends on the timing of recovery. Everything depends on timing of recovery. I mean, the, you know, a lot of interest in OPEC uh, uh, actions, a lot of interest in curtailments or cuts out of uh, producers. Uh, but the real uh, the real question is when and how does demand return? And certainly, uh, it would appear that the market has found a bottom. Uh, most of the data you look at from anywhere in the world would suggest we're not seeing demand erode even further right now. Uh, and in some places, we're beginning to see signs that demand is is coming back a little bit, although it's still well off of where it was uh, prior to the. But, to but the you are price. seeing a, you are seeing a, some signs. I mean, we, when we look at gasoline stations, I mean, our, the data we have shows that it's, it's coming back a little bit, gasoline demand. Yeah, it is. Certainly in the U.S., uh, we've seen it even in some states that have been locked down pretty hard. Um, weekly gasoline sales have been inching up. Some of the other countries that are through this a little bit further, or at least through the first wave, uh, we've seen a stronger recovery in that. Uh, air travel, not so much yet. That That still is a pretty... Pretty tough, um, pretty tough market, uh, but it, it doesn't look like things are getting worse, and, and they're gradually getting better now. I think the real question is: uh, Is there a second wave of the virus? Do we see some of these policies uh, uh, restrain activity again, or are we on a gradual resumption of, uh, of economic activity pointed back towards something that looks like it did prior to the crisis? And at this point, there's there's no answer. I mean, events will determine that. Well, let me just ask you one or two more questions in this uh, conversation. Uh, you've observed that there's a lot of disparity, maybe more than there's ever been or for a long time among the major companies. And maybe just ask you how you see what you mean by the different strategies and the different approaches. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And if you, you know, I, I go back 10 years ago or so and I remember being with our executive team and we had the visions and strategies of all the major competitors on a whiteboard, but they didn't have logos. And the idea was to you know, try to match the company with the strategy. And, um, and some people couldn't even identify our own. <laughs> uh, they were so similar. An embarrassing moment. <laughs> but there, you know, there, there was a period of time when the strategies across the industry looked very much alike. And, um, and I don't think we see that anymore. I think we've seen um, some very distinct uh, choices being made by different companies in positioning. And, and whether it's um, upstream, downstream weighting, uh, oil and gas weighting, uh, conventional energy versus um, energy transition uh, weighting, uh, there are a series of, of choices that companies have made. and, and um, and, and trajectories they've begun to put their companies on that don't all follow uh, along the same path the way they once did. And, um, and I think that creates um, some very interesting choices for investors as they look at um, what kind of exposure they want. Uh, I think it creates uh, interesting choices for the companies as we look to recruit talent and compete, invest in technology, have access to markets, uh, because some people are, you know, doubling down on certain things and others are kind of stepping back from, from other things. And so the, um, I think the choices being made for investment uh, in hard assets, in technology and in capability are really beginning to, uh, to, to spread apart more than we've seen really during my career. Well, is it, you know, as we, we know that the world is, this is accelerated digitalization. 
is it too soon to say if, whether you all have started thinking about what kind of world you'll be working in and planning for when this is over, whenever it's over? No, we're having those discussions. Uh, as we talked about earlier, people are working differently than they had before. We were already, like so many others, uh, embarking upon uh, a digital journey to uh, begin to take you know, decades of legacy technology platforms and take advantage of the cloud, of mobility, of artificial intelligence, and some of the things you can do with big data now. I think this only accelerates uh, that journey as you know, we really see uh, the value of it and, um, and and people become more confident in, in these technologies. And of course, we've all had to be much more flexible in terms of how we work, how we trust our employees, how they get their work done. And, um, and I think there will be a new paradigm, if you want to call it that, uh, on the other side of this. I don't think everybody will always work from home, but I also think that the traditional model where everybody always comes uh, to the same place where everybody get, you know, people get on planes to go to meetings that they might be able to do using other technologies. I think there will be changes. And, uh, and I think, you know, every company in every industry will have to sort through those. I think the drivers will be slightly different depending upon the type of business and the ge geography you cover. But, uh, but I, I think this is a bit of a pivot point in, in many ways. And certainly the, the way that we work, uh, I believe, is, is one of those. So it will be both changes internally in how the company works and then changes in the world that, that you provide services and, and fuel to. Yeah, that's right. And it's, um, it's very interesting because you can, and of course, as you said earlier, nobody really knows the pace of the recovery. And it's very hard, I think, to be certain as to what structural changes uh, will occur. You can hypothesize that air travel uh, may not come back uh, for a long time. You certainly hear some of the airlines uh, that are that are worried about this. Uh, you hear people talk about the fact that their commuting may not uh, be the same as it was before. On the other hand, if you look at the data on public transportation and both levels of usage of public transportation and people's attitudes about public transportation, uh, they're very reluctant to get on a bus or a train uh, or even a ride share, a, a van pool or a, a, an Uber uh, pool kind of a thing uh, because they're putting themselves in contact with others who they, they, they don't know. And so there's, uh, there's some pretty good data coming out of China and other places now that would suggest uh, uh, at least a near-term uh, predisposition for people to move from public transit to private vehicles, which has demand implications as well. And so... Um, I think the uh, I think the landscape that will emerge will be different. Um, I think it's very hard to predict it, and I think it will be different in different countries, different markets, based on on things that will be unique to those to those regions. So I think we're all going to have to be pretty alert to those changes and and assess markets uh, not based on what we think might happen, but based on as much objective data as we can. It says here's how people are actually behaving. Thank you very much, Mike, for taking the time to talk with us. This has been very insightful. I'm Dan Jurgen, and we've been talking with Mike Worth, the chairman and CEO of Chevron, about pandemics and the lessons from previous pandemics and uh, how that uh, helped uh, Chevron prepare for where, where the world is today, about how the companies adapted, how the markets changed, uh, adjusting to the market, and also thinking about the future. So thank you for joining us on this CRW Conversation.